was uh, just that, an idea. And I, I remember some of you having some skepticism, uh, as did I. And yet, I, we hung in there together, and with your support, uh, we have uh, made some progress that I would like to share with you tonight. First thing, I, I often start out my talks with an exercise that we won't do tonight, but I'm going to describe it. Can people hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, if you can't, just raise your hand. Um, and the exercise is called the human barometer. It's, have any of you ever done it? Okay, Susan's done it. All right, so uh, what you say is on this wall, people strongly agree. On this wall, people strongly disagree. And then I put up a statement. And I ask people to position themselves along the continuum. And then I'll go and interview them as to what caused them to place themselves, whether they strongly agree or disagree. Fairly frequently, a couple of times a month, I talk with college students. Yesterday I did a, a convocation at Merrimack College in North Andover. And there was a, 150 students there. And we did this exercise. Strongly agree, strongly disagree. And we put up, I put up this statement. My country will be at war throughout my lifetime. 85% of the students were over here. Strongly agreeing. There were a few right in the middle and I, w I went over and I said, well, what caused you to, to be close to the middle? And the young man said, I couldn't get any closer. I wanted to be next to the wall. And then there, there was one young woman, an outlier, over here on, on strongly disagree. So I walked over and I said, now, you're apart from the group. What caused you to place yourself here? And she said, I'm from Canada. <laughs> And so I think about that in terms of the context that we work in today, where 30 years ago, and, and I, I had the, the um, treat to have uh, dinner tonight with Cecil Collins, my old friend from Minnesota. 30 years ago, she was working on the freeze campaign, and um, I was working on the Jobs of Peace campaign, and so we interacted a lot at that time in, in St. Paul. At that time in the Jobs of Peace campaign, we were organizing against a permanent war economy. Now, a generation later, we have our young people believing that it's permanent war. When we talk about protection of civilians, I find myself being very sober. Indeed, in real terms, more civilians are under threat today than ever in the history of the world. I work most of the time in New York these days and have interns. A couple of years ago, I had an intern by the name of Danny. Danny comes from Syria. And he was a Fulbright scholar. And he came to Eastern Mennonite University in September of 2010 to study to get a master's in peace building. We all know what happened in March of 2011. Within a few weeks, the Syrian army is at Danny's family's house in Damascus, saying, where's Danny? We want to bring him into officer's training. Danny's at Eastern Mennonite University. Well, Fulbright has a, um, a policy that when one completes his or her study, they have to return to their home country. And it, it's a, a well-intentioned policy so that people don't, so that we don't create a brain drain. So Danny was facing going back to Syria. And the thing that would allow him to stay under Fulbright was if he got an internship 
uh, that was related to his studies. So he started interning with me and interned until he got his asylum here. And today he works as a social worker in Brooklyn and Queens with families who are newly arriving from the Middle East. And he called me a couple of months ago, late at night, and said, you know, I was just assigned to a case, a school in Queens called me. And there's a new little boy in kindergarten. His family has just arrived from Syria. And they can't get him to stop crying. He cries all day, every day in school. And as we talked about it, we said, you know, he has the same response to the situation that he's facing, to the situation that we're facing. That little boy's crying for all of us. So what I, I'd like to spend time with tonight is going over quickly a little more about the need, then describing what is unarmed civilian protection and how it's evolved in terms of methodology. Does it work? Why, how do we know it's working? What's on the horizon? And of course, what all of you can do. Because we're going to do this together or we're not going to do it. This is requiring a cast of thousands of us from around the world. But most importantly, usually when I, I talk to groups, if, if I have this slide, I say, I want to spark your moral imagination. But with you, <laughs> not a, that would be presumptuous to say spark. So I want to reinforce your moral imagination and remind you that there are always options. So often we are placed in the false dichotomy when presented with a, a mass atrocity situation where we're told we either stand by and do nothing or we send in the bombers. We heard that last summer. We heard that last fall. Again and again, and that's a false trapped dichotomy. There are always alternatives. And that's where we come in to fill in the alternatives between doing nothing or sending in the bombers and the drones. Diane de Prima wrote, the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed by it. There are one and a half billion of us who live in countries with repeated violence. And in terms of the Millennial Development Goals, those basic eight goals that were passed by the General Assembly at the UN in 2000, that were to be benchmarks that we as a global community were to have achieved by the end of this year, Basic things like universal girls' education, a basic subsistence level of uh, standard of living. No country that is among those with repeated violence will have achieved one of those eight millennial development goals by the end of this year. And the vast majority of the victims of violent conflict are civilians. And this percentage is growing. It's upward of 75%. What's the largest recorded battle in North American history? Anybody have a guess in recorded history? And which battle? Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Do you know how many civilians were killed in Gettysburg? Seven. You're close. One. One woman who was baking bread how many civilians were killed. Today, upwards of 75% of the casualties of war are civilians. And this is done as a matter of strategy. There is a few collateral damage, as they euphemistically say, but most of the civilians that are killed are killed as a matter of modern warfare and are killed on purpose. So that's where we come in. <clears throat> The UN High Commission on Refugees found 
that in 2013, the number of those living as refugees from war or persecution, that means people who have crossed an international border, exceeded 50 million for the first time since World War II. And that number has grown in the past year. And Jan Egeland, who was the former head of the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs at the UN and now heads the Norwegian Refugee Council, observed that when people are displaced, <coughs> the average is now 17 years. So this is not a trivial action when we hear that people have fled, when people have uh, been displaced, when they have left their homes. They are away for a long time. And we're hearing that right now in terms of the suburb of Damascus where the Palestinians are living that is now being besieged by ISIS. And we hear that it's the third generation of Palestinians who are living as refugees in that suburb. And in terms of climate disruption, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change observed in their report that we can expect violent conflict to increase over land, water, and other resources. So it gives some substance to why those kids at Merrimack yesterday were all lining up over on this side. So one of the responses that we've been developing to the crisis that so many civilians find themselves in is unarmed civilian protection, or providing direct physical protection to people who are under direct threat. We also work with local civil society to help them to protect themselves and to reduce violence and local mechanisms, because all communities have capacities and mechanisms. Some of them are overwhelmed because of the violent conditions, but they're there. And so helping those communities to strengthen their internal peace infrastructures. And it, I just put this up here to kind of overwhelm you. Um, I, but I, this gives you an idea of what goes into the whole practice of unarmed civilian protection. We have key principles, the first of which is nonviolence. The second is the primacy of local actors. We aren't there uh, to bring our own agendas. We are there to help to create or protect the space so local people can do their peace building work, their human rights defense, and stay alive. We try to uphold, uphold the principle of civilian immunity to war which is a global norm, a global standard that's being ignored today. We are nonpartisan in that we are not there to pick sides. We believe that that's the job of local people. We're there to help create and protect the space and to keep civilians safe. We are independent. We are civil, civilian to civilian. There's a number of guidance principles that we follow, including international humanitarian law, refugee law and human rights law, and key methodologies and skills that I'll get into in a moment. We currently have about 210 people who are on the ground and are working in South Sudan, the Mindanao region of the Philippines, Myanmar, and uh, we are starting a project in Ukraine and a project in Syria. Our teams uh, come from throughout the world. Presently, they come from 25 different countries. And half of the teams that are in a country come from the, the host country uh, itself. And this has uh, become quite interesting. Some of you may remember that our first project was in Sri Lanka. And we were in Sri Lanka for nine years. We've now been in the field, believe it or not, almost 12 years. And we were in Sri Lanka for nine years. And one of the uh, key activities we would do would be to accompany moms whose children had been abducted to be forced to become child soldiers. 
and to accompany those mothers to the camps where the children had been taken. And whether it be the Tamil Tigers or the surrogates that were fighting on behalf of the government who were also abducting children, if we showed up, they would release the kids. And we worked a lot with local Sri Lankans on that strategy of child protection. Well now, a number of them, a number of the local Sri Lankans are working in South Sudan, taking what they learned and working with communities in South Sudan for the protection of the children there. And so there's that key South-South kind of uh, transfer of experience. We're intergender in that um, right now 43% of our civilian protectors in the field are women. That's not enough. Uh, but if we compare that to the UN armed peacekeepers, ah. where they have 3% of uh, their peacekeepers are women. And we find that women are uh, uh, very effective in terms of especially working with women who have been subjected to gender-based violence uh, and uh, who aren't really interested in working with men or in uh, trusting men to provide protection. Our uh, civilian protectors are specially trained. We're full-time. That's all we do is protection. We live and work in the communities that we serve. We're nonviolent and neutral. We base our work upon strategy, on conflict analysis, and the application of some methods that I'll get into in a moment, and we're cost effective. It costs us right now about $50,000 a year to train, transport, house, feed, insure, uh, provide a home visit, and pay a typical stipend of about $2,000 a month. It costs us about $50,000 uh, per unarmed civilian peacekeeper. Those of us who uh, are paying our taxes in the United States are paying $1 million per soldier in Afghanistan. So we're the fiscal conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> There's a number of methodologies that we use, 10 in total, and I'll get into some examples of that in a couple of minutes. But this is just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with when we're in a situation analyzing a conflict and looking which combination of these particular methodologies fit for the particular situation that we're in. And so you can go from site to site and the work will look different because it's different measures of these uh, various strategies that we're employing. And now this one surprised me. Selkirk College in British Columbia has started putting together a database and looking at all the work that's been done in terms of unarmed civilian protection. And what they found was between 1990 and 2014, there were 50 applications of unarmed civilian protection of some form or another by 35 organizations. And we're seeing that this is percolating up. Often uh, people will refer to David Hartso and I as the founders of Nonviolent Peace Force. And that's a little bit like saying that the Wright brothers invented the airplane. There were lots of people working on airplanes when the Wright brothers made that flight in Kitty Hawk some of whom had flown farther. I, but the idea, the methodology was percolating up in a variety of places. That's what we're finding now in terms of unarmed civilian protection and peacekeeping. That it's percolating up that people that we don't hear about, that we don't know, are trying it. And we're starting to come together and understand each other and how this can be applied in a larger fashion. Our, larger, our largest project right now is in South Sudan, where we have 150 people who are on the ground in 10 locations. I was working in Ann's kitchen this afternoon and, and putting these slides together, and I pulled this slide out 
and it read over one million people are displaced. And I recall to an article in the New York Times this morning where the UN reported yesterday that it's now over two million people who have been displaced. What happens in South Sudan, uh, an, over 100,000 people have <coughs> fled to the vicinity of UN compounds, to what are called protection of civilian areas or sites. These are not camps. The word camp would dignify the condition too much. But people have assembled, they've gone there for some measure of security in terms of proximity. Well, the women who are there leave every day to get water, to get firewood, to grind sorghum. And patrols of soldiers lurk outside the camps and will routinely gang rape the women. And some of the women have told us that the soldiers will say, this is part of our job. They're being brutally honest in terms of the way that gender-based violence is being used as a weapon of war. What we found, this is um, Tiago from Brazil. And uh, we have another one of our civilian protectors in the back. That if two of our people go with 20 or 30 women, the soldiers will look the other way and leave the women alone. That's been 100% successful over the past year. We have 150 people in South Sudan. We could use 10 times that many just doing this accompaniment. Remember me telling you about the child protection work. There are a lot of unaccompanied minors who show up in the IDP camps, the protection of civilian areas, and in the refugee camps. Their parents have been killed or they've been separated, and they become preyed, they are preyed upon by the various armed actors to be soldiers. We, we come upon uh, young boys whose guns are, they're not much taller than the guns that they're carrying. We find that, this is actually Vic uh, from the Philippines, that if our people are there, are present in the camp with the kids, the armed actors stay away. They leave the kids alone. A year ago this month, Andreas and Derek were escorting 14 women and children who had been caught in the bush and were in a very perilous area. And they were bringing them back and going to one of the protection of civilian areas in a place called Boar. This gives you an idea of what that place looks like. Shortly after they arrived there, the perimeter was breached by a militia and the militia men started shooting people point blank and killing them. Andreas and Derek took the 14 women and children into a mud hut and stood in the doorway. On three occasions, the young militia men, younger than these two, you know, these guys are in their early 30s, I came to them. And Derek and Andreas say, they, there's an interview of them on our website. And they talk about how shiny the AK-47s were in these young militiamen hands. And how many AK-47s are manufactured in South Sudan? Yeah. There's lots of people getting rich off this war, and they don't live in the countries that are suffering. So on three occasions, these militia said to Derek and Andreas, you have to go, we want those people. On all three occasions, they held up their identification badges that showed they were the nonviolent peace force. They said, we are unarmed, we are here to protect civilians, and we will not leave. After the third time, the militia left. Now, some people, a, a typical reaction was from some people is, oh, they were lucky. And maybe they were. But Derek and Andreas will tell you that they, they believe if they would have been armed, they would have been killed. But they changed the equation. They changed the relationship by being calm, by standing there, 
in merely stating their intention. They changed that relationship with those young militiamen. In another part of South Sudan, one of the, uh, another method that we use is early warning, early response, where we help communities to identify what are those criteria, what are those signals that I uh, say that trouble's brewing. And people know that. They but they have ideas. And so to help people to list that out, and early warning's not enough without early response. And so we'll work in helping to train and organize usually multi-ethnic teams in the community who then, along with um, some of the international civilian protectors, will go to the site of uh, where violence has broken out. So this was a situation in um, uh, Lake State, rather remote area of South Sudan, where the early warning signal had been sounded, a uh, fight had broken out, uh, there was shooting, two clans had squared off against each other. And part of the response from our team included Asha, Asha Ashokan, who's from uh, India. And if you know Indian history, her last name's Ashokan, Ashoka. Uh, and Asha's barely five feet. And one of our other team members, Abraham, is uh, from the Dinka tribe and is six foot five. <laughs> and so they showed up together. And one of the young fighters turned to Abraham and said, who's the small girl? And Abraham said, boy, that's Asha Ashokan. Well, where's she from? She's from India. Well, why is she here? She's here to get you to quit fighting. The young man in the midst of the fight said, if someone's going to care that much to come that far to get us to stop fighting, we'll stop. And he called his guys off. Now, that's a moment. That's not sustainable peace building. <coughs> but in the midst of violence, moments mean everything. That gave us a chance to convene the rival chiefs who met all night, worked out a resolution. And these two clans, since that time, have not gone back to fighting one another. Now, you may say, well, you know, they're fighting all the time. That's gone on for centuries. It'll go on for centuries to come. There's a brutal civil war that we broke out here last uh, year ago, December. And there are many international interests there because when South Sudan became an independent nation, 75% of the oil stayed on their side of the border. And so there are lots of international interests that want to exploit fights like uh, occur between those clans, and in fact, that's <coughs> happening often. Is in, on the island of Mindanao in the Philippines, no one has ever accused us of chasing headlines when I say, well, one of our largest projects is in Mindanao. Um, few people know where that is, but it's been the home to an ongoing conflict between the uh, people who have lived there for centuries, the Moro people who are uh, Muslim and never saw themselves as Filipino. That was a decision that was made by colonial cartographers. And so there was a conflict that had arisen between the government of the Philippines and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front that had gone on for several years. We were invited there in 2007 and things got worse. In 2008, we were thinking, what, what are we doing here? The, uh, the warfare had intensified, but we decided to stay on. And by the end of 2009, a ceasefire was brokered by the Malaysians. And we were invited, and this is where the nonpartisanship comes in so importantly. We were invited by both the government of the Philippines and by the Moro Islamic Liberation Front to I uh, be a party to the ceasefire monitoring and given responsibility for civilian protection. So for the next four years, we had a team, uh, nine teams throughout the island, who would monitor, uh, who would verify, who would report on a daily basis to all the entities. But more importantly, we trained 300 local people. 
who were from throughout the area, in many grassroots parts of the, of the island, in monitoring, verifying, reporting. So that spread the reach of the ceasefire. And more importantly, most importantly, it deepened the roots. People felt ownership over this. So that was an element that led to a comprehensive peace agreement that was signed a year ago this month. Now there's been some bumps along the way. It's still moving towards a uh, settlement that's scheduled for next year. So we still have a team there that's helping to um, support stability during this very fragile time. <coughs> will lead uh, to a uh, final peace agreement. Now, how many of you have read about the peace agreement in Mindanao? <laughs> One. <laughs> okay. I, Another illustration. We don't get reports about peace. This was a major agreement a year ago. And it had a little paragraph in the New York Times. During that ceasefire monitoring time, there was an incident where a patrol from the armed forces of the Philippines was converging on a village from one side, and a patrol from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front was coming on the village from another side. People were starting to panic, to pack up, to flee. The elders in the village called our team that was close by and told them what was happening. So our team said, well, we'll be there. In route, in modern day warfare, you have the local commanders on speed dial. So they called the commander of the armed forces of the Philippines, and the commander of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, now these are not pacifist organizations, um, and said to them, you know, there must be a mistake. Your guys, and by this time they'd gotten within 500 meters of the village. Your guys are converging on this village, people are panicking, they're starting to flee. And remember what Jan Eglin told us about how long people are away when they flee? And we know you don't want that to happen. And so to assure that doesn't happen, our team is going to go and stay in the village until your guys back off. Both patrols backed off and a thousand people stay home, stayed home. And this gives you an idea of what our team looks like. I, Robert from the US, Bernard from Ireland, uh, Rebecca from Ghana, um, Youssef from Burundi, I, all there, all saying we're here. We're staying here until the threat leaves. And that was one of the elements that civilian-based ceasefire monitoring that led uh, to the um, signing of the peace agreement. And trivia, who is this? Aquino, yes, that's Corey Aquino's son, who's now the president of the Philippines. So does this work? For us, a good day is when nothing happens. So how do you prove that you were responsible for nothing happening? Marketers do it all the time. We buy cold medicine, you know, <laughs> to keep us from getting a cold. We have started to do uh, both quantitative and, for a longer term, qualitative uh, analysis. This uh, was a quantitative impact analysis, and as a side, Susel Ken Solper uh, headed this up, uh, one of our old mutual friends, and I, who's a, a dean of a graduate school in, in Minneapolis. And what they found in surveying uh, people in Mindanao is those, they compared villages where we were with villages where we weren't, and found that people reported feeling safer and more secure. Most significantly, they reported a greater capacity on their own to respond to threats of violence, and also a, a greater awareness of the peace process. These were all statistically significant findings. And in a qualitative, I, I love this, this photo, um, in a, a qualitative uh, evaluation that was completed last summer by a European group called Media Tour, uh, 
they found that the armed actors on both sides confirmed that the presence of a third party watching over them, including nonviolent peace force, has served to temper their behavior. This reinforces things that, that we've been finding over the last couple of decades. Liam Mahoney, who some of you know, found this when he studied uh, the work of Peace Brigades International in Guatemala in the 1980s. We're showing over and over again that this kind of work does temper the behavior of armed actors. And how many people saw um, Hotel Rwanda? So at least half of us. Well, that's Don Cheadle, who pay, played Paul Recessa Begina, and that's Paul Recessa Begina, the hotel manager who, through his guile and his courage, and his creativity sheltered and saved at least 1,200 people during the genocide in Rwanda 21, 21 years ago this month. And Paul um, actually has helped us with fundraising. And he believes that even a small number of unarmed civilian protectors in Rwanda could have reduced the number of people who were slaughtered. So why does this work? Why would groups of young militia with brand new AK-47s give a damn about some guy from Mexico standing in the, in the doorway of a hut? And we found that this works both on the basis of deterrence and encouragement. We try to understand what is important to all sides and to focus on what they care about. And it's our business to communicate with all of the armed actors. They don't have to love us. They don't have to like us. We aren't there to be popular. But they have to know who we are, how to get a hold of us, what we're doing, why we're doing it. If we sneak up on somebody on, in the field, if we surprise someone, we haven't done our job. So this actually um, is part of uh, Liam's work that he's been working on. In terms of deterrence, what we find is decision makers, whether they're state-based or non-state actors, that almost always there's a chain of command. And the decision to target civilians isn't made at this level. Every once in a while, yes. But usually it's made here and here. So, Within the international community, often what we do is to put pressure on the decision making, on the elites. Amnesty International does a good job at this. I, we see it in terms of the imposition of sanctions I, by the United States or by the UN or by the EU or other entities. And that usually goes about that far down the chain of command and increasingly gets deflected back. We found when we were in Sri Lanka, which at the time was a government that was one of the worst abusers of their own civilians of any place on the planet. I was spending some time uh, talking with some congressional staff. And over and over again, I was hearing, well, the human rights situation in, in Sri Lanka is good. And I was saying, our, our teams are there. I mean, they're, they're seeing this every day, the killing of civilians. <coughs> when we scratched the surface, what we found was that the Sri Lankan <coughs> government was employing one of the highest buck lobby firms in Washington to name names, Pat and Box. I look them up on the net. They've got a slick website. Tommy Box is uh, the principal. His dad was the Speaker of the House, Hale Box. His mom was a congressman. His sister, we see on ABC on Sunday mornings and here on NPR, Cokie Roberts. So not to say that Cokie's involved in this, but these guys are well connected. And the perpetrators of human rights, rights abuses know that better than we do. And they know who to hire. So also we find down the chain of command that people will deny that they're a part of it. And in meeting with, with armed actors, I, I've often heard, oh, we're so glad you're here because it's those bastards. 
And we said, okay, that's all right. You know, uh, just so you know, we're here and what we're doing. So the value that we and other unarmed civilian protectors can provide is that we are in the field, so we can provide information up to put on international pressure. So I'm in, in daily contact with our field operations and bringing information to various entities at the UN. And we also find that that can get blocked. So our value is to know where those pressure points are down the chain of command and then to address those increasingly. And if you ever think, God, does anything that we do make a difference? Remember this, increasingly down the chain of command, people are worried about international tribunals like the International Criminal Court. They don't want Asha Ashokan, who happens to be an international human rights attorney also, to show up in the Hague in a couple of years. So these kinds of things do make a difference. We find down the chain of command, it can be community pressure, it can be familial pressure, it can be faith-based pressure, and it's our business to know where those pressure points are so that we can block the violence against the civilians. Now that's the deterrence part. We also work on encouragement. Since we only go at the invitation of local organizations that are committed to protection, reconciliation, and human rights, that tends to enhance their capacity. This was a, a women's human rights defense group in Mindanao, and our team working with them. This was, in fact, Fong, who was our first civilian protector from the People's Republic of China. And we find that if we model nonviolence, that inspires nonviolent behavior in others. There's work non, done now on um, mirror neurons that I, I think is, is, is an important uh, thing for us to study and, and learn more about. But on a behavioral level, if someone is there and acting nonviolently, that can encourage that behavior in others. If we think back, some of us can remember times when that's happened to us. Well, remember me telling you about accompanying those moms to the camps in Sri Lanka to retrieve their kids. A couple of years later, they were organizing in the streets against the practice of the abduction of child soldiers and made an important contribution to end that practice. And most importantly, and least understood, I think this works because we offer the power of presence. Did, did you see the movie Selma? And this, the scenes um, of when the various uh, people from the north, primarily white people, came to provide that presence. Now the work and the, the risk, uh, a great deal of the, the risk was incurred by the black people of the south. That, this is not to take that, that away from them. But also, there were people like Rabbi Heschel, mm -hmm. who would come often to make sure those connections were made, to make sure that what was happening was not being done in silence, was not being lost upon uh, communities in the north. Rabbi Heschel once said, my prayer is my feet. And of course, this led to you know, it wasn't lost on the North. It was on all the, the uh, TV stations. So I find that, as Thich Nhat Hanh reminds us, the most precious gift that we can offer others is our presence. To be there without any particular extraordinary power, but to offer our humanity. And what we find is that in doing that, it's a much more mutual uh, form of protection than we ever conceived of when we were starting this, that we're actually protecting one another. So, a 
A lot of you are Quakers. I don't have to remind you of this. Ordinary people have brought about change throughout history. It starts from the grassroots. It starts from people like you and I. It doesn't have to be a future of inevitable war where our kids and grandkids believe that war is just part of the landscape. And we can put asterisks next to each one of these and say, yes, there was abolition, but look at human trafficking, look at human slavery today. But it is not internationally sanctioned. There are not international laws uh, that support this. And I, have any of you read the book Burying the Chains? Yes. Yes. You know, the, the history of the late 18th century, early 19th century abolitionist movement in the United Kingdom, led by Quakers, led by freed slaves, led by slave uprisings in the Caribbean, all of that conspiring together to put an end to the slave trade in the United Kingdom. Those kinds of things can and do happen. Bringing down the, the end of apartheid, the emergence of human rights, the restrictions on child labor, the rapid spread of anti-colonialism. And we can say, yes, but there's neo-colonialism. I'm not saying that it's perfect. I'm saying that change happens. The ban on atmospheric nuclear testing is some of us prepare to go to New York in a couple of weeks. The su successive waves of democracy. We're all co-creating all the time, whether we, we want to or not. By being a part of creation, we're part of the change. And as some of the um, astronomy uh, research that's coming out, we're, we're living not in the universe, but in multiverses. We're creating all the time. So let's be intentional about it and serve that, what, that which is emerging. And is that multiverse or universe benevolent? Dr. King thought so. Not easy. It takes a long time. But it bends towards justice. And I know you're never supposed to put wrong quotes on, on PowerPoints, but I love this quote so much from Gandhi. I do dimly perceive that while it's all around me is ever changing, ever dying, there is underlying all that change a living power that changes not, that holds all together, that creates, dissolves, and recreates. And is this power malevolent or benevolent? I see it as purely benevolent, for I do see in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of death, and I was sharing with, with Suzel at, at at dinner, I've seen things I'd rather not see. And I hope I've been exposed to the most brutal that we're capable of. But in the midst of all of that, life does persist. <clears throat> so we're ordinary people. And we can add to that list. We can end war. As the preamble for the UN Education and Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, says, and this is gender specific, wars start in the minds of men, and wars can end in the minds and the creativity and the courage of women and men. And it's happening right now. So, what's on the horizon? We are starting new projects. We received a grant from the European Union to start a project in Syria that will begin in June. We'll be working with the Syrian Civil Coalition, which is a coalition of 60 Syrian organizations that are working on reconciliation and human rights and peace. I'm sure you've read about them a lot um, and seen features about them on CNN, right? And anybody seen those? Or read in the Globe about these groups doing peace and justice every day in Syria? 
You see why the kids are lining up on this wall? Because people doing this work in Syria, in Ukraine, in the Central African Republic are ignored, are minimalized, are, are minimized. A little over a month ago, I was in Beirut working with some of our partners who will be working with us on the Syria project. And I was with three young women one evening, and we were sitting around smoking shisha, actually, um, which is a, a tobacco, not a, a, a hash. Uh, um, sure. Not hash, no. Uh, and we were talking. And two of these women I worked with for the past two and a half years. They were in a training that we did in Egypt. And they have started uh, an organization in Syria called Mubadarum, which is Arabic for initiators. And they have a network of 6,000 peace builders throughout the country. And they have 300 peace bridges, they call them, and 60 peace ambassadors. They refuse to be victims. They said that. They said, we refuse to be victims. And we will continue right on with this work. And as I sat there in the midst of, of planning this work that, that I certainly it, it is a glimmer of a hope. And we all know that the violence is getting worse. I had this strange feeling as I looked at these three women, not one of them 35, and thought, the world's in good hands. The world's in good hands. And then a little while later I thought, regardless of what happens, these are the people I'm going to stand beside. And lots of us around the world are willing to do that given the opportunity. So we'll be doing that in Syria. We've started doing training uh, the weekend before last in Ukraine. And hopefully we'll get a grant in uh, June so we can start deploying um, unarmed civilian protectors there. And next month we'll do an exploration in the Central Africa Republic. Some of those Venn di diagrams that you saw before and those circular charts and so on, we put together in terms of a curriculum. Uh, and we're working with the UN Training and Research Organization, UNITAR, for an online a uh, course on unarmed civilian protection that will be hosted by UNITARA and will be up in October. We're also working on case studies and good practices. There's enough of us doing this work that we have to be serious and rigorous about identifying what are the methods that are working under what conditions and what can be replicated and scaled up. Because in the end, this isn't about nonviolent peace force. As much as we need your money tonight, nonviolent peace force will grow, will flourish, and will wither. What this is about is a set of effective methodologies that have been shown to protect civilians that don't require more violence, that moves us away from violence. And when we identify and spread that methodology, lots more of us can do it. Lots more of us can do it in Northampton, and can do it in Belarus, and can do it in Chiapas, in many places. And so we're under, uh, currently we have completed the field work on case studies in South Sudan, in Mindanao, and in Colombia, in looking at the practices that have gone on there. We will be bringing those to a good practices conference where we bring the practitioners, those people that you saw spread out on that map that Selkirk created. Because we've never been in the same room together. We don't know each other. And use those case studies to really pull out what it is that working so we can be more effective, but more importantly, so we can spread the methodology. If anybody knows, I mentioned we're doing three case studies. We've completed the case work, or the field work, in South Sudan, in Mindanao, in Colombia. We want to do Israel-Palestine, but we need $6,000 to do it. Anybody knows anyone with $6,000, we can send a team to do that case study within the next six weeks. 
We're also working right now, the UN uh, has a high level review of peace operations that's going on, a panel that was appointed by Ban Ki-moon, and uh, their report is due at the end of next month. And we're working with them uh, to help them to include unarmed, nonviolent ways of peacekeeping and civilian protection in addition to uh, the military ways that they are already spending almost $9 billion on. Where was that last one? Oh. Yeah. Where? Uh, the UN uh, peacekeeping <clears throat> spends about $9 billion a year on 16 um, uh, deployments throughout the world. They have about 100,000 soldiers who are deployed. So we can all know, <laughs> we can all get in there and push. Um, and unfortunately during the rainy season, this is, this is frequent. Um, we need research, we need people who can help us to do the kinds of research that's necessary uh, to really take hard looks at this work, to expose our flaws, to uh, document what's working so that we can become better. There's many ways to volunteer. Ann Moore is now in your midst. Ann's one of the best organizers I've ever met. And she's been with us uh, from the beginning. And so you're very lucky to have her uh, in this area. I believe in prayer. We're a um, non-sectarian. I always get non-sectarian and secular mixed up. Non-sectarian means non-religious, right? We're non-religious as no, an organization. Secular. 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 That's what I want. I get those. I, I don't know why. I always get mixed up with those terms. Okay, we're secular. But I believe that prayer helps us. And so we certainly, those who pray, can use your prayers. And we need your money. I'm unabashed about that. We need money to continue this work, to make sure that we can send more civilian protectors, to make sure that we can do this work more effectively, and that we can spread the methodology throughout the world. We're also recruiting unarmed civilian protectors. Look at our website, nonviolentpeaceforce.org. Right now, we're training at this very moment 27 new people in South Sudan. And we've got another team coming in at the end of the month that will be training. And most importantly, talk, blog, write letters to the editor, tweet, write Facebook. And I know you're on Facebook, because Facebook is trending to people our age. Um, we're all showing pictures of our grandkids. Um, but talk about alternatives of doing nothing or sending in the bombers. So I just included this because I love this quote, and I love Rabbi Heschel, that our goal, as bleak as the world might seem to us, should be to live life in radical amazement, radical amazement, to get up in the morning and look at the world in a way that takes nothing for granted. It still is a wonderful, beautiful world. So thank you for this time, and I'm certainly available to you. So questions, challenges, conversations that anybody might want to venture for. <coughs> I have a, a question that was just raised with this, with this last piece on the, uh, on the UN and peacekeepers. Um, any of us who have ever encountered those uh, men and I guess some women with those baby blue helmets yeah. know that they are not peacekeepers, in fact. And I wonder what your experience working with the UN, what, what would it be if the real peacekeepers, the UN peacekeepers, were the peace force? Have you talked with them about that? <laughs> yes, often. Um, and, and I'm not one to, be, to bash the UN. I spend a lot of my time there right now. Uh, Nonviolent Peace Force has consultative status at the UN. Uh, and what does it can that be. Mean? Um, 
it means that I, we went through a process with the Economic and Social Council I, where we were approved by this 19 member states on that council and they review and they accept certain non-governmental organizations that then allow us access to UN agencies and meetings and to consult with them on various issues. So we consult on civilian protection. Um, what I can tell you is our experience in the field, uh, which is in South Sudan, where there are 12,000 armed peacekeepers. <coughs> Remember me, the photo of Tiago escorting the women? Um, we have tried to get the armed peacekeepers to at least patrol those roads where the women walk, and we have been consistently told, no, that would be too much of a security risk. <laughs> and I, what we also found is that I, our people have documented cases of armed peacekeepers being in guard towers, recording, reporting, but not intervening when women are being dragged into the woods. And we find that unconscionable, and we bring that to people's attention all the time. I, and so I, if we had $9 billion? The UN does. Yes. <laughs> um, but we, we're part of an evolution of shifting from uh, the belief that the protection of civilians is something that has to be done by military might. And uh, it happens in some cases, but not, not most often. And so our work, especially with this high-level review panel, is to work with them on understanding, uh, on seeing uh, examples of how this works without guns. So hopefully we can help a shift in a, a, a monolith that moves at a glacial pace. Thank you. Seth. Um, the piece of what I would say, uh, hold on Seth, there's two microphones, so I'm gonna um, move one around so you can ask questions. Uh, the peace movement, I would say. Uh, Bruce? Yeah. Go ahead, we can hear you. Oh. The peace movement, I would say, is um, centered a lot on Syria, and I, I wondered if you could just flesh out the, how does it go when you try to go into Syria? We, we, we've seen how it went when the United Nations tried to go in. And, offer some young humanitarian aid. I mean, the Syrians are starving. They're, they've been very, very cold this winter. And um, how, how many different places in Syria do you think you can get into? What, what are you, how are you starting? Or just talk a little bit about it. Because that's something the peace movement does. <coughs> and unfortunate, at least part of the peace movement in the US I uh, became very, very partisan uh, in terms of anti-Assad. And uh, there's good reason for that. But I, I was part of a delegation that went to Syria uh, with Murray McGuire, the Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, from Northern Ireland. And the, the Assad uh, government has been doing despicable things for two generations. But I remember coming back, and I actually met with the State Department and said, you are arming, you are training, don't lie to me, I know you're arming, because at that time they were claiming they weren't, uh, and training rebels in the North who are doing equally horrible things. And by pouring more arms into there, you're just going to make the matters worse. You don't know who is being trained. I was told I was naive. <laughs> I was told that I was naive. Um, and in fact, I, we were, I, ISIS hadn't arisen at that point, but uh, the major arms supplier to ISIS is the US. Um, and now, I, the, and the peace movement, not all the peace movement, but a portion of the peace movement fell into demonizing Assad. And I don't think that that we should be in the business of demonizing anyone. 
And now the United States, on one hand, <coughs> rhetorically, continues to de demonize Assad, and on the other hand, coordinates military activities with them in the, in the Northwest. US and Syrian airplanes, fighters, have occupied the same airspace since August, and there haven't been any crashes. <laughs> so uh, it's a tricky game. We demonize Iran, <coughs> and we're giving weapons to fight the surrogates for Iran and Yemen, and at the same time, uh, working a shoulder's distance away from Iran and Tikrit and Mosul. And so I, I think that at least part of the U.S. peace movement got diverted into picking sides on that one. When the civil society groups on the ground in Syria were saying clearly, no more arms to anybody. That's a, something we could unite over, is an arms embargo to all sides. And sending more arms in from any side merely exacerbates that, that conflict. In terms of what we'll be doing, we'll be focusing on 45 uh, uh, leaders and organizers from 15 to 20 groups who are located throughout the country, who are, some are from groups that oppose the government, some are neutral, some support the government. And we'll be working with them on very specific civilian protection, localized ceasefire plans, violence reduction, and then convening them periodically to strengthen the ties, the connections, across those political and religious and geographic divides. Because our theory is that civil society, a diverse pluralistic civil society, provides a hope for a future of Syria. And we're very humble about it. It's, it's a glimmer. It's, you know, I, but a glimmer is better than doing nothing. Up close, right? You spoke about South Sudan, and I've been very emotionally and physically involved with Darfur, which is west of Sudan, South Sudan. And thinking, why, why aren't you there? And then I read, how to get there? You have to be asked. And I don't think there's not a community group here to invite you. Is there? There, there are community groups in Darfur. There is civil society there. Um, we have to be able to get in the country. And um, President al-Bashir uh, is not interested in us getting in the country. And uh, we do need uh, to be clear that uh, Darfur is the world's longest running genocide. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. Because it's the forgotten war. It is. And even more forgotten are the Nuba Mountains mm -hmm. in the south. Mm -hmm. I, and those areas are being bombed every day by the Khartoum government. And people literally are living in caves. We, we work with some of the people from the Nuba Mountains because that's close to the border. And they come across <coughs> uh, into South Sudan. I, but that's. I, I don't know what we can do at this point. Um, uh, Mr. Al-Bashir has been indicted by the criminal court. Um, and clearly we could put pressure, I think, on some of the, our African allies who are ignoring that indictment. Because he seems to be able to travel with impunity uh, within much of Africa. Uh, but it is a, a dreadful situation. And if we had an opening, we certainly would consider going there quickly. I'm lucky in our area to have Michael Clare, who has identified so clearly the uh, war, wars for resources, and, and now what we call, some of us call the extraction economy. And uh, so I think it, um, I wonder what your comments are about the resources in these mountains and in the areas being um, the underlying driving force. Uh, the race for what's left is this most recent book 
um, as being a driving force for these wars and uh, conflicts and drone attacks? It, it definitely is a driving force. Uh, the oil in South Sudan uh, that uh, is there and is substantial. Um, the uh, resources of water. Um, I, in every, I'm, I'm trying to think, maybe not in every, but in almost every conflict that we've been in, there's been a uh, competition for resources. And as the, uh, the UN uh, panel on uh, climate change shows, those conflicts will, will become worse. And so that's why it's so important that we learn to deal with conflicts and to protect civilians without violence because that competition and conflict is going to grow. Here I am. I don't know quite how to put this, um, but <clears throat> um, maybe just my own uh, take on many conflicts is I definitely feel I have a side. I know, I think I, I sort of figure out who's the villain and who's the victim, and, and I have very strong feelings about it. I'm sure your peacekeepers and you likewise have strong feelings about, you know, who's doing what to whom. <laughs> How do you manage that? You almost caught me in my comments about Mr. Al Bashir. <laughs> <laughs> um, we see people doing dreadful things. And our people are trained in uh, uh, nonpartisanship, and the basis of that training is empathy and learning empathy. And we have specific um, exercises and discussions and training that we do to reinforce that understanding of empathy. We don't have to condone or agree, but we have to understand. And then we have to understand that our role is one of protecting civilians within a context, and that we can be more effective by maintaining our nonpartisanship. For example, we would have never been part of that civilian monitoring of the ceasefire in Mindanao had we been partisan. We would have never been able to even work there. And so that it's also, in, after reinforcing the empathy and understanding the nonpartisanship, it's also understanding our role and what that is. It's not to say that different people don't have different roles. I'm not saying we should have a nonpartisan world. I'm saying what we do in terms of civilian protection requires that nonpartisanship. Let so, so, <laughs> me just carry this a little further. So, yeah, I see that, especially in Mindanao, how your, your, your ability to stand uh, talk to both sides was pretty helpful. So, and so you try to understand what both sides are feeling, but if you really think one side is the perpetrator and the other side is the victim, do you just try to set that aside and say, you know, stay focused on your goal and protect civilians and never mind what you think, who you think is right or who you think is wrong? It's a choice of strategies. In those situations, um, we were in Guatemala, for example. Um, what was more important for us to do than to be internationals and go down and take a principled stand and condemn someone was to help protect the space so that the human rights defenders could do their work and stay alive. Now, they were choosing uh, what they were going to do themselves. And they happened to be um, gathering information on the genocide that was being carried out, in this case, by some political candidates. Uh, it, they could be partisan. And they certainly were uh, confronting oppressive forces. And it was our job to help to protect and extend a safer space for them to be able to do that and not get killed. And we chose to do that instead of taking a, a stance of saying, you know, the genocide was wrong, and um, uh, of course it's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of choosing what the strategies are, 
it's more effective for the people there. Now, I'm not saying the people in this country shouldn't be putting pressure on our government and denouncing and doing all the kinds of things that we do. But I'm saying in terms of the civilian protection work that we do, it's important that we maintain that nonpartisanship. I was intrigued with the connection that you made between young people in the U.S. feeling that our country is always going to be at war and what's happening around the world with the um, with local conflicts where U.S. actually does have a role. And I wonder how you address that role of the U.S. or other countries that have an interest in perpetuating conflict, whether it's through because of arms sales or whether it's because of um, wanting to control resources and like how how you work back up that chain of command to those you know those players who are pushing the conflicts in those ways. Well, you're right. Our our country has a role in many of those conflicts. I was in Mindanao one time in a, in a city called Zamboanga, and I was walking with one of our longtime civilian protectors, a guy named Ulu, uh, from Kenya. And as we walked down the street, people were saying, hey Joe, hi Joe. And he was nodding and waving back, and I finally said, Ulu, what is this Joe thing? And he said, the only black people they've ever seen here are, are US Marines, and so they assume I'm from the US. <laughs> Um, and so we certainly uh, provide information to other groups who uh, then do the advocacy work, do the advocacy work in this country and other countries. And uh, we will provide them with the information that we have. Uh, but in terms of our particular role, uh, and it's a matter of choosing what you're gonna do, uh, and our particular role is the protection of civilians and the deterrence of violence on the ground. Knowing that's a piece of it. It's not the whole picture. It has to be done in concert. Well, it strikes me. It's on, Chris. Yeah. It strikes me that you would not be able to provide that information if you weren't being nonpartisan. Isn't that true? You get the information because you are nonpartisan. Yes, yeah, we get into all kinds of places that others don't. That's right. We just say, see things that others don't. Uh, clearly, if we have partisan stances, we wouldn't get into countries to do the civilian protection in the first place. So. Um, uh, aside from anything else, the word imagination has one M, and that would help, perhaps. Oh, you know how to spell imagination? One slide back. Did uh, I misspell it? Yeah. Indeed. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so just just to give you some imagination on the on the spelling issue, but uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I, um, you know, am, 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 am part of a, a, a local group that convinces me to go to things like this, and I typically assume that I'm going to be the only representative under 60 um, at anything like this. Um, so, I, 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 I think I think that's probably just worth noting. Uh, I don't I don't know if I have a question about that. My question is more specifically about the 14 people in that hut. How do you choose which 14 people to protect? And what do you say to the 14 people that you don't protect? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in this case, it was people that we were alerted to that were out, that were connected to a place where we were living. And uh, so we knew about them. It's a matter of referral from local people. And lots of times that's within a context that we're working in. And you're right, we are always making choices that you know, we have a 150 people in a country where two million people are displaced. And so we try to find those places where we're living, where we can have the most impact. And at times, 
It's not even that. It's those who, who are most threatened who are right in front of us. And we develop localized strategies with our partners, and those strategies do involve a conflict analysis and then an ongoing context analysis that takes place uh, two or three times a week. And that helps us to be strategic and to decide what it is that we can do that will have a longer term effect in terms of violence deterrence. So that's the, the first line. But if there's somebody in front of us that's under threat and we can do something, we'll do it. So there's the strategy, but there's also the reaction. This question over here. And Bluff, I, I also I want to bring up that the median age for our peacekeepers is about 36. And I, so I, it does skew a little younger than this audience in terms of <laughs> people who are in the field. 